morning, colleagues, graduate students, and esteemed visitors. My name is Jules DeWalt, and I'm the chair and professor in the Department of Physical Therapy and Human Movement Sciences, as well as a professor in biomedical engineering. I would like to welcome each of you to this bioethics symposium entitled Patient or Subject, the Ethics of Translational Research. This symposium has been made possible by a generous supplemental grant from the Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering, Depart uh, Bioengineering Institute, NIBIP, at the NIH to our interdisciplinary T32 training grant in movement and rehabilitation <coughs> sciences. This grant provides graduates, uh, graduate students interdisciplinary training uh, to uh, uh, you know, inter the interdisciplinary training in biomedical engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, combined with a, a, a DPT training or doctoral training in physical therapy. It emphasizes translational research from animal to quantitative human uh, to the delivery of rehabilitation care using science independent quantitative approaches employing robotics, imaging techniques, neural machine interfaces, etc. There are, no, there are two other training grants with distinct movement science and translational flavor in neuroscience and neural engineering here at Northwestern University, managed by uh, myself and Dr. Eric Pro, respectively. Students supported on these grants are also participating today, and a number of them were instrumental in the organization of today's program together with our local bioethical experts. At this juncture, I would like to take a moment to introduce our distinguished visitors and local experts in bioethics who are joining us today and leading the various sessions. Participating in our first session entitled Conflicts of Interest in Translational Research are Carl Elliott from the Center of Bioethics of the University of Minnesota, Timothy Fournier, the Managing Director of uh, Euron Consulting, Stefan Helms Tillery, Department of Biomedical Engineering, Arizona State University. Participating in the second session entitled Therapeutic Misconception in Translational Research are Paul Applebaum, Department of uh, Psychiatry, Columbia University, Debjani Mukherjee, Medical Humanities and Bioethics, Northwestern University. And participating in our third session um, is um, uh, entitled Ethics Education for Scientists, Clinicians, and uh, Engineers is Rosa Lynn uh, Pincus from the Center of Bioethics and Health Law at the University of uh, Pittsburgh. Without a solid ethical foundation, science, science would lose its morning, moorings, would, stay, um, would stray from serving the pursuit of truth, and would instead wander into the pursuit of self-interest and preconceived ideas. The symposium will provide a mixture of speakers uh, and, and panel discussions and question answer sessions. We encourage all of you to be active participants and give her the, the caliber of both visiting and local experts in the field of bioethics. We expect that this symposium will provide a number of fresh bioethical perspectives to all of us who are investigators in translational biomedical research, which will ultimately impact the delivery of rehabilitation and overall medical care. I wish you all a most successful symposium. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the first session of the day, uh, the theme of which is conflicts of interest. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our first speaker, Dr. Carl Elliott, um, whose expertise in biomedical ethics uh, combined with his joint academic and medical backgrounds made him an obvious choice for this symposium. Dr. Elliott is a professor in the Center for Bioethics and the Departments of Pediatrics and Philosophy at the University of Minnesota, as well as an affiliate faculty member in the School of Journalism and Mass Communications. He was educated at Davidson College in North Carolina and at Glasgow University in Scotland, where he received his PhD in philosophy. He received his MD from the Medical University of South Carolina. Prior to his appointment at the University of Minnesota in 1997, he was on the faculty of McGill University in Montreal. Additionally, he has held postdoctoral or visiting appointments at the University of Chicago, East Carolina University, the University of Otago, and the University of Natal Medical School. Dr. Elliott's articles have appeared in the New Yorker, the Atlantic Monthly, the London Review of Books, Mother Jones, and the New England Journal of Medicine. He has also been the author or editor of uh, seven books. Dr. Elliott's current scholarly interests include corruption, enhancement technologies, research ethics, and the philosophy of psychiatry. 
Today he will be presenting a talk entitled Clinical Trials as Pharmaceutical Marketing Tools. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming Dr. Elliott. I'm going to give you the most demoralizing talk you've ever heard. <laughs> and uh, I say that seriously. It's always good to start out with a little anger and bitterness. And that's what I hope to bring here uh, today. Um, I want to start out, uh, I'm going to talk about conflict of interest, but I want to start out with a case. And it's a case I know well because it's um, one that happened at my own institution, uh, the University of Minnesota. So I'm going to start with this story. It begins with a uh, woman named Mary Weiss and her son Dan, who are pictured here. Um, Mary lives in Cottage Grove, that's a suburb of St. Paul. She, uh, she's a former postal worker and uh, raised Dan as a single mom in South St. Paul. And uh, let me just show you a few pictures of Dan here. He, you can see he's a very uh, cute kid, very good looking, extremely smart, uh, made a perfect score on the verbal part of his SATs, uh, went to the University of Michigan, did a literature degree there, and um, graduated, moved out to L.A., where he was hoping to become a screenwriter. So this is the summer of 2003. Uh, Mary goes out to L.A. to visit him. And when she gets there, it's clear that something is uh, very wrong. He's behaving really bizarrely. He's built a wall of wooden blocks around his bed. He's got $5 bills placed in between the blocks. He says that's to protect him from aliens. He shows Mary a spot on the carpet. He says that's uh, from an alien's visit. They burned it there. He keeps talking about this event uh, that he seems to be assuming Mary knows about and is involved in in some way, but she has no idea what he's talking about. And he's changed his name to Dan Markinson from Dan Weiss for reasons that seem very unclear to her. She gets panicked. She calls 911. The police come. Uh, but when they get there, Dan convinces them that uh, she's just overact overreacting. She says, look, my mother's drove all the way out from Minnesota. She's very tired. Everything's going to be OK. And so they buy it and uh, leave. She tries to convince Dan to come back to St. Paul with her. He refuses. Um, he comes briefly in August, then goes back to L.A., and then in the fall comes back uh, to St. Paul again, as it turns out, permanently. Now, uh, by this point in the fall, it's becoming clear that Dan's not just delusional. He's also dangerous. And his delusions revolve around a satanic cult that he's convinced is orchestrating some sort of event in uh, Duluth, Minnesota. And he has a part in this event, and his uh, part in this event is mass murder. One of the people that he is supposed to murder is his mother, Mary. You can sort of see the extent of his delusions from emails that he's sending around uh, September of that year. So by November, um, Mary gets so alarmed that uh, by the things Dan's saying that she calls the police in St. Paul. And this time, uh, they take him in. They, uh, he winds up at Fairview Hospital, which is our teaching hospital at the University of Minnesota. And he's seen by uh, a psychiatrist, the head of our schizophrenia program, a man named uh, Steve Olson. Olson thinks Dan is psychotic, that he's dangerous. And, um, and in fact, he's so dangerous that he needs to be involuntarily committed to the state institution. Now, uh, in Minnesota, if you want to give patients neuroleptic drugs, antipsychotic drugs, you have to get actual uh, written signed consent. Uh, Olson writes in Dan's chart that Dan is mentally incompetent to make that decision. A few days later, he's seen by a clinical psychologist um, who pretty much says the same thing, that he is psychotic, that he's dangerous, that he's incompetent to make his own medical decisions, and that he needs to be committed. He uh, explained in his note that Dan believed that his mother was a lizard and was threatening to slit her throat. Now, uh, this is the point at which things start to get strange, not just clinically strange, but um, sort of institutionally strange. Now, you probably know that involuntary 
commitment is a legal procedure, and it's a legal procedure that's reserved for patients who are, one, mentally ill, and two, dangerous to themselves or to other people. In Minnesota, patients um, have a, another option to commitment called a stay of commitment. And what a stay of commitment means is that you can uh, avoid actual physical confinement on one condition. That condition is that you agree to abide by the treatment recommendations of your psychiatrist. So um, on November 20th, that's what Olson recommends, that Dan be given a stay of commitment, which means he can avoid going to the state hospital as long as he does what Olson says. And the court says, okay. But then Olson does something unusual. Instead of just treating Dan, he asks him to sign up for a drug study. And Dan said, sure. And he signs the consent form when Mary's not there. So Mary finds out, and she's stunned. She doesn't want Dan in any study. He's clearly psychotic, he's delusional, and he's threatening to kill her. Just a couple of days before, everybody who had seen him agreed that he was incompetent to consent to, neuro, to take neuroleptic drugs. So her question is, um, if he's incompetent to consent to take these drugs, how could he possibly be competent to consent to a study in which he'll be given the same drugs. And what's more, how can his consent be valid when the alternative to consenting is confinement to an institution in Anoka? She tells Olson, I don't want him in this study. Olson says, look, it's not your choice, it's Dan's choice, and he already signed the consent form. So what was that study? It's a study uh, funded by AstraZeneca, and like a lot of these industry studies, it's got this weirdly benign sounding name. It's called the CAFE study. CAFE is an acronym for comparison of atypicals in first episode. So first episode psychosis, patients who are experiencing their very first psychotic break. It's aimed at those patients. It lasts a full year. And subjects are supposed to be getting um, one of three different neuroleptics known as atypical antipsychotics. Those drugs are Seroquel, that's the drug made by AstraZeneca, Risperdal, which is made by Janssen, or Zyprexa, which is made by Eli Lilly. Studies randomized, it's blinded, that means neither Dan nor Olson knows what drug he's gonna be taking. The principal investigator is Olson, he has a co-investigator who is his department chair, Charles Schultz. Now, um, at this point, I need to point out a couple of red flags with this study that neither Mary nor Dan knew about because they're not the kinds of things that patients are told. First red flag is about who should not be in these studies. Patients with schizophrenia are, in general, at greater risk of killing themselves and at greater risk of killing other people um, than, uh, than others. And so, when you look at most studies of neuroleptic drugs, they will say, do not enroll these patients. For some reason, the CAFE study only excluded patients at risk of suicide. It made no mention of homicide or violence to others. That explains why Dan, who had been involuntarily committed precisely because he was threatening to kill people, but not to kill himself, could be recruited into the study. So that's the first red flag. Second red flag is a red flag about money. Dan was on public assistance. That's the, uh, he's on the Minnesota version of Medicaid. And ordinarily, if somebody like Dan turns up at our teaching hospital, they're a money loser. But if they're enrolled in a clinical trial, that financial equation changes. AstraZeneca was giving the Department of psychiatry $15,648 for each subject who completed the CAFE study. So in total that means $327,000 for the Department of Psychiatry. Now here I just want to step back and point out for a second that that's the kind of conflict of interest that nobody really talks about in research. Pharmaceutical companies pay up to five times as much uh, as 
insurance companies for procedures and office visits. And if Medicaid's paying rather than an insurance company, that figure goes up uh, much higher. So very often, it's going to be much more profitable to put a subject in a trial than to treat them outside the trial. It's a huge conflict of interest for an institution, but I have yet to see an IRB that talks about it. Now, uh, that 327000 where does it go? It doesn't go into Olson's pocket. It goes to the institution. It mainly paid the salaries of his staff and a portion of his salary. But he's also getting other money from AstraZeneca. This is a uh, disclosure from a talk he gave in 2006, I believe. He was a member of the AstraZeneca Speakers Bureau, which means he's giving marketing talks for the company. In fact, he's giving marketing talks for almost every company that makes atypicals. In Minnesota, uh, since the mid-90s, we've had a publicly available database that tracks how much money uh, physicians are getting from the pharmaceutical industry. According to that database, Olson had gotten a total of $220,000 over the previous five years or so. Uh, that figure is much higher for his co-investigator and department chair, uh, Charles Schultz, who'd gotten over um, half a million. So Dan stays in the hospital about two weeks. Then he's transferred to a halfway house in St. Paul. At this point, um, this is where accounts differ. According to Stephen Olson, uh, Dan did very well in that halfway house. According to Mary, he got much worse. She says he became reclusive, he stopped changing his clothes, his thoughts got more grandiose, more delusional, and the most alarming thing to Mary was how angry and how agitated he became. She says he's so tense it's about he's, he's like he's about to explode. She is alarmed. She's trying everything that she can think of to get him out of the study. She writes letters, she goes to the Department of Psychiatry, she makes phone calls again and again. All told, she writes five letters to Olson and Schultz telling them how agitated, how full of rage that Dan is. And the only reply she got, one letter said, it's not clear to me how you thought the treatment team should deal with this issue. Finally, in April of 2004, she leaves a voicemail with the stu study coordinator saying, do we have to wait until he kills himself or somebody else before anybody does anything? Three weeks after she left that message, early in the morning of May 8th, she gets a knock on our door. It's a Catholic priest and a police officer. The priest puts out his hand and says, I'm sorry to tell you that Dan passed away last night. In fact, he didn't just pass away. He'd stabbed himself to death in the shower with a utility knife. In fact, he had stabbed himself so violently and so many times that he had severed his own throat almost to the point of decapitation and ripped open his abdomen from throat to groin. His body had been discovered early that morning by a halfway house worker along with a note on the nightstand that said, I went through this experience smiling. And later when uh, Mary had the medication analyzed, she found he was being treated with Seroquel, which is the drug made by AstraZeneca, the study sponsor. So, let me step back from this story a minute and give you a little background. First piece of background I need to give you is about <clears throat> the neuroleptic drugs or antipsychotic drugs. What are they? Um, neuroleptics developed in the 1950s. First neuroleptic was Thorazine. Until pretty recently, uh, neuroleptics were seen as some of the really the most uh, unpleasant drugs in the, med in the uh, medicine closet. Um, people hate to take them and the reason they hate to take them is not just because they make you feel sluggish and stupid. Um, they can also call, cause so-called extrapyramidal symptoms. What's that? Um, well, if you've seen somebody who's been on neuroleptics for years, you'll know what I mean. They're you know, twitching, rigid muscles, uh, shuffling walk, the kind of dystonia that you see in this uh, drug ad. And the most notorious is a side effect called tardive dyskinesia, uh, which are these involuntary twitches and twisting movements of the um, uh, tongue and the face and the lips. 
And the really bad thing about those symptoms is that they can be permanent. So they don't just go away when you stop taking the drugs. And so while it's true that neuroleptics can dampen down some of the really bad symptoms of um, schizophrenia, the delusions, the hallucinations, the crazy thoughts, and so on, side effects were so disabling until that until um, fairly recently, nobody really wanted to give them to patients unless they had pretty severe disease, or at least not to give them for very long. That was the old days. Over the past uh, 10 years or so, the neuroleptics have undergone a stunning rehabilitation. By 2008, they had become the single most profitable class of drugs in America. So more profitable than lipid drugs like Lipitor and Zocor, uh, more profitable than antidepressants, more profitable than any of the drugs for allergies or blood pressure or any of the other things that we ordinarily think of as blockbusters. In fact, by 2008, Seroquel was the fifth most profitable drug in America with about $4 billion a year in sales. Those numbers have dropped off a little bit uh, in the last few years as Zyprexa and Seroquel have gone off patent, but still uh, antipsychotics are uh, around the fifth most profitable class of drugs in, in the United States. So the question is what happened? How did these drugs become so profitable? How did we go from ads like that to ads like that? Well, uh, the answer starts in the 1990s when we started to see the so-called atypical antipsychotics, drugs uh, like Risperdal, Cyprexa, and Seroquel. What the industry did was pitch those as a sort of new and improved antipsychotic, you know, more, more effective than your grandfather's antipsychotics and none of those ugly side effects. Hugely expensive drugs, but if you could avoid the dystonias and the tardive dyskinesia and so on, felt like the trade-off in price was worth it. And so they took off. Within about 10 years, they're not just for schizophrenia anymore. They're being prescribed for anxiety, for agitation, uh, for demented patients, uh, for insomnia, for ADHD, for depression. Psychiatrists started giving them to children for the first time, especially children with behavioral problems. Biggest uptick is bipolar disorder. Uh, used to be seen as pretty rare, not anymore. Now that you can treat bipolar with atypicals, psychiatrists see it everywhere by at least one count bipolar diagnoses have jumped by a 50-fold factor since the introduction of the atypicals. Now today we're several years into backlash phase and the biggest uh, contributor to that black backlash was a large federally funded trial known as the Katy study. Katy was an unbiased authoritative trial comparing the atypicals to an older neuroleptic. Here's what it found. Um, one, atypicals didn't uh, perform any better than the older neuroleptic. Two, 75% of patients just stopped taking the drugs. They found them so unpleasant. And three, despite all the industry hype, in general, the side effect profiles were no better than the older atypical. In other words, you were at just as great a risk of getting those extra pyramidal symptoms on an atypical as you were on a drug developed in the 50s or 60s. Now, in the meantime, litigation uh, has begun. Turns out that the atypicals also make people gain weight and increase their risk of diabetes, and that the companies have known this for over a decade and have been hiding it. In 2009, Eli Lilly, that's the, the company that makes Cyprexa, settled a $1.4 billion lawsuit for fraudulent marketing. Um, at the time, that was the largest health care fraud settlement in history. And since then, Pfizer overtook it with $2.4 billion, and then just recently, GlaxoSmithKline with $3 billion. Um, but at the time, it was the, it was the largest. Around that same time, the editor of the British Journal of Psychiatry, Peter Tyre, wrote an editorial in the Lancet, basically saying atypicals are an invention of the drug industry and that the industry had invented them um, for marketing purposes. Now, um, in the year after that editorial appeared, 
litigation over Seroquel began. And uh, remember, Seroquel is the drug that Dan was taking, and AstraZeneca, the maker, was the sponsor of the CAFE study. So litigation over Seroquel began, and industry documents started to be unsealed. And those documents make it pretty clear that AstraZeneca was manipulating their research data. Um, let me just show you a few internal memos and emails that appeared in that litigation. So here's a, an internal email from a publications manager who is actually worried about what the company's doing. Uh, his name is John Tumas. He's worried about the ethics and he's worried about how this is going to seem, uh, how it's going to be seen. I've got a bigger view for you here. So he says, look, we're cherry picking data. We buried trials 13, 15, and 56. Now we're considering burying CoStar. Um, how are we going to face the outside world when they criticize us for suppressing our data? This is another email from a company scientist to an external doctor who's asked for research funding, and he's explaining to him uh, why they can't fund his study. He says, uh, basically, research and development is no longer responsible for uh, Seroquel research. That's the responsibility of sales and marketing now. So at this point, they have turned over research on the drug to the marketing department. Here's a, an internal PowerPoint about a glucose metabolism trial that they're doing. Remember, what they're worried about now is this accusation that the drug causes uh, diabetes and weight gain. Um, what is the purpose of the study? Uh, well, they say the purpose is to produce data that will help us generate commercially attractive messages, <laughs> which is exactly what you would expect, expect if you have turned over research to your marketing department. So the most interesting slides for me, since I work at the University of Minnesota, are the ones that trace back to the University of Minnesota. And I'll just show you uh, a few of those. This is a, an internal email about uh, a trial called Study 41. And what Study 41 was doing was comparing the extended release version of Seroquel to placebo. And one of the places where that study was done was the University of Minnesota. And sort of remarkably, what Study uh, 41 showed was Seroquel performing no better than placebo. You can see here AstraZeneca is referring to it as code red failed study, right? So what do you do when you have a code red failed study? Well, what AstraZeneca does is hang on to it. They don't publish it for six years. And in the meantime, they do it again. And this time they do it in India, Bulgaria, Romania, the Philippines, Russia, Greece, and South Africa. And this time they get a positive result. So they published that one. And uh, as you'll see, one of the authors of that study is the chair of psychiatry at Minnesota, Charles Schultz, the co-investigator on the CAFE study, who, uh, as it happened, presented the data at the APA meeting and um, was quoted in press releases claiming that <laughs> Seroquel was superior to placebo. He was actually not uh, one of the site investigators for this study. He was a site investigator for the study that showed Seroquel uh, no better than placebo. This is an even more alarming email. This is one about a trial called uh, Study 15. And a Study 15 is an earlier study. And it's comparing the standard version of Seroquel to Haldol. Haldol is a standard antipsychotic uh, that's been around since the 60s. And so what study 15 finds is Seroquel is no better than Haldol. In fact, in a lot of measures, it's worse than Haldol. And so yet again, Astra has a, a study that if it's made public, is gonna damage their drug. So what do they do with it? Well, um, this time they decide to spin it, or as they put it, uh, do a smoke and mirrors job with it. And uh, the front man for the smoke and mirrors is, once again, um, Charles Schultz, our chair of psychiatry. 
Schultz presents the data at the APA in 2000. He's quoted in a press release uh, basically saying that, in fact, Seroquel is significantly superior to Haldol. He speaks about the dramatic benefits of the drug. And a few years ago, he's caught when these documents come out. He's caught. This is a story from our local paper, the Star Tribune. Um, caught, but not punished. He is uh, defended by the university, of course. So uh, there's the background for you. Let's uh, review. We've got a class of drugs, the atypicals, that have become enormously profitable on the basis of a falsehood. That is, the claim that they work better than older drugs without the side effects. We've got evidence that AstraZeneca has been intentionally manipulating research data to boost sales of their atypical, Seroquel. And we have a link to the University of Minnesota where a young man has committed suicide after being coerced into a Seroquel trial that was extremely profitable for the university. So the question is, uh, what happened after Dan died? Well, um, what happened was this. Olson filed an adverse event report. Uh, the IRB filed that away. Um, the FDA investigated. Uh, they thought that neither Astra nor the university nor the doctors bore any blame for Dan's death. In their report, there's no mention of financial conflicts of interest. There's no mention that Dan had been threatening to kill anyone. There's no mention that Mary had tried for months to get him out of the trial. Uh, the FDA dismissed the idea that Dan may have been incompetent to consent. They said, there's nothing different about this subject uh, than the others enrolled to suggest that he could not provide uh, voluntary informed consent. Now, the university's uh, response, which the FDA agreed with, was that the CAFE study was essentially the same as standard therapy. Right, so that basically the three drugs in the trial were all FDA approved and that if he hadn't been in the CAFE study, um, he probably would have gotten one of these three drugs anyway, which is true. He probably would have. But if he hadn't been in the CAFE study, he and his doctors would have known what drug he was taking. When, they did, when he didn't do well on it, they could have stopped it. They could have also added other drugs. The side effect that he was uh, experiencing, the kind of agitation, uh, is not a, an uncommon side effect of neuroleptics. It can be dangerous. But the study had very strict guidelines about what can be done. Dan wanted his medications changed. Uh, Olson would have had to drop him from the study. If he dropped him from the study, that would have meant forfeiting uh, a fair amount of the money that the university was getting for the study. Mary Weiss eventually uh, sued. That's how I found out about it. Dan's story was written up in the St. Paul Pioneer Press. Uh, that went nowhere. The judge um, dismissed the suit uh, with a summary judgment, ruling that the University of Minnesota was essentially immune from lawsuit. Suit against Olson was settled out of court. He was given a penalty of $75,000, essentially, a slap on the wrist. Now, of course, uh, the university hired a battery of expert witnesses to testify that it had done nothing wrong. This is the list of experts. Uh, you'll see two ethicists on that list, Robin Shapiro and uh, Paul Applebaum, who happens to be one of our speakers today. So I thought I'd just highlight a few things from his testimony. According to the documents presented to the court, um, he could be expected to testify that uh, neither the Nuremberg Code nor the Declaration of Helsinki is binding on the IRB, that there's no research data about whether persons with mental illness are more susceptible to other persons to coercion, and that the University of Minnesota IRB did not violate any bioethical standards. So much for bioethics. How about the IRB itself? Well, the IRB, during the deposition, uh, the director of our IRB, Maura Keene, said that um, protecting subjects was not the responsibility of the IRB. Just not their job. That's the job of AstraZeneca and the PI. 
Now, uh, at this point, I hope I've convinced you that an injustice has been done. Uh, but I don't want to stop there, because I think it's easy to get distracted by the particular wrongdoing in this case, the commitment order, the coercion, and to lose sight of the larger issue, which is very different. And that larger problem is the study itself. The CAFE study is essentially a marketing tool disguised as a clinical trial. So let's just look briefly at that. So when I looked at it, uh, the first thing that struck me about this trial was what trial designers call the outcome measure. CAFE study is supposed to be testing how effective these th three different drugs are. How do they measure that? Well, they measure it by the amount of time the subject takes the drug before he quits taking it. The longer the subject takes the drug, the more effective it is. If that strikes you as odd, um, it should. That's not really the way you measure effectiveness for uh, most other drugs. Usually you measure effectiveness by how much the subject improves or fails to improve. When I showed that to uh, psychiatrists who didn't do clinical trials, they didn't actually find that, uh, that unusual. I said, that's often how we do trials. Uh, what they did find a problem with was the sample size. When I showed the trial to Peter Tyrer, the editor of the British Journal of Psychiatry, he said, in scientific terms, it's of very little value. Because with only 400 subjects and really about 120 only about 120 finished the trial, it's uh, way underpowered. It's unlikely to be able to detect any difference between those three drugs. Why is that relevant? Well, it's relevant because um, the failure to detect a difference means that Astra can claim that Seroquel was as good as the other two drugs. And in their press releases, that's pretty much what they did. When I showed the study to David Healy, at the University of Cardiff in Wales, he says, look, this is an entirely marketing-driven exercise. Now, the thing that I would uh, want to point out here mm -hmm. is that the CAFE study is not unusual. In fact, I would say probably every IRB in the country is approving studies like this. Because what's happened over the past two decades is that clinical trials have become totally integrated into pharmaceutical marketing. You design the trials in order to sell your drugs. How does that work? Well, it can work in a lot of different ways. Here's a, uh, a sort of schema of this uh, developed by Richard Smith, the editor, of the former editor of the British Medical Journal. It says, look, you can underpower the trial the way that AstraZeneca did and then claim equivalence. You can test your drug against a drug that you already know is inferior. You can underdose the competitor drug so that it looks less effective than your drug. You can overdose the competitor drug so that it looks more toxic than your drug. If you do that, you don't even need to spin your data. You just design the trial to get the data that you want. And so for the neuroleptics, the antipsychotics, this is exactly how things have played out. Whoever funds the trial wins. 2006, the American Journal of Psychiatry published a study that looked at 32 head-to-head -head trials of of atypical antipsychotics. So these are trials very much like the CAFE study, studies that are comparing one atypical to the others. And what they found was that 90% of them came out positively for whichever company had designed and paid for the trial. So when Lilly is paying for the trial, Zyprexa wins. When Janssen is paying for the trial, Risperdal wins. And when AstraZeneca is paying for the trial, Seroquel wins. Now, that's not unique to psychiatry, and it's why we've seen so many pharmaceutical fraud stories over the past decade. Pattern's pretty much the same for each one of them. New drug comes on the market, looks great, clinical trials looks excellent, doctors write scripts like crazy, drug earns billions of dollars in profits, and then, after those few fat years, the problems start to come out. Heart attacks, heart failure, stroke, diabetes, pulmonary hypertension, suicide. And so there's litigation. And as the litigation unfolds, it becomes apparent that the company's known about these problems for years, but they've managed to hide them or spin them 
or downplay them in their scientific publications. So if you look in the medical literature, drug looks great. It's only when you start looking at the documents that are unsealed in litigation that you start to understand what's been going on, which is a massive deception. Vioxx, Finfin, Primarin, Avandia, Zyprexa, Neurontin, Paxil, Zoloft, Bextra, Geodon, Seroquel. Names change, but the plot's basically the same, which is why Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet, is called Medical Journals an Information Laundering Operation for the Pharmaceutical Industry. Now, a lot of people have been saying that for a number of years now. Horton's not the first, neither is Richard Smith or Marsha Angel or Bud Relman or Jerry Kassir. Um, but the people who've been blowing the whistle generally treat this as a data integrity problem. You can't trust what you read in the medical journals anymore, which is true, we can't. But to me, that's only part of the problem because what you have to remember is all of these studies involve real patients who are taking real risks, and sometimes those patients die. Now, it's one thing to ask people to take risks for the good of science or for the common good or to help other people. It's another thing entirely to ask them to take risks to advance the marketing goals of the pharmaceutical industry. So let me just finish by telling you what happened uh, with Mary Weiss because her story is still not finished. <clears throat> you might think it can't get much worse than losing your only child to suicide. Uh, but you'd be wrong, it can get worse. There's a coda to this story that still makes me angry whenever I think about it. When Mary's lawsuit was dismissed, the University of Minnesota turned around and filed a legal action against her for $50,000. This is called a notice to assess costs. The university has said that uh, this is what it was owed to cover its legal expenses uh, including the costs of the expert witnesses it had hired. When I talked to Mary's lawyer, um, this was when I wrote about this in Mother Jones uh, two years ago, uh, she said that was the first time in 14 years of legal practice that she had ever seen that happen. When I talked to her more recently, she said, look, I'm starting to see it uh, more now with the tobacco industry. But this is not a tobacco company. It's not even a pharmaceutical company. This is a university, my university, retaliating against the mother of a dead child. And that's where it ends. Thank you very much. I told her I was going to demoralize you. I hope I've done it. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? My question is, could you talk a little bit about how this uh, entering into this story, publicizing it, talking about it, has impacted you as a faculty member in your university? Um, have there been repercussions as far as your career is concerned or your role within the university and among your colleagues? Haven't been pretty. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, it's a good way to alienate all your colleagues. I think I've, uh, I think I'm basically public enemy number one in the academic health center. And uh, my colleagues in the center for bioethics are getting increasingly angry at me for refusing to drop the issue. Um, the the most, um, I guess, the most. Uh, direct response was uh, last spring, the general counsel of the university and the dean of the medical school and the vice president of research went to the academic freedom and tenure committee to uh, ask them what actions could be taken against faculty members who disseminated false information about uh, research activities at the university. Um, and the, to be honest, the Academic Freedom and Tenure Committee was quite sympathetic to that, 
you know, to that request. Um, but at the next meeting, a number of my colleagues, I should say not colleagues in the Academic Health Center, uh, but colleagues in the College of Liberal Arts, uh, in the Department of Philosophy and Anthropology and so on, went to the Academic Freedom, uh, academic, uh, freedom and Tenure Committee and uh, <coughs> basically uh, stuck up for me. And it became a news item, and the university backed down after that. Um, but it's been very, it's been ugly. I mean, we've seen a series of uh, funding cuts to the Bioethics Center. And when I actually had a, uh, had a meeting with the dean just a few days ago, and uh, I made, uh, you know, what my Bioethics Center colleagues consider the, you know, huge error of actually mentioning the name Markinson in that meeting, and he was not happy. <laughs> Hi. Um, so not that I don't agree with your overarching point, but as for the parameters of the study, um, compliance rates with antipsychotics are often very low. So even with a measured outcome of compliance over time, um, do you not see that as a somewhat appropriate measure for an antipsychotic su study? Well, this is, the, this is the argument for it, that mm -hmm. uh, look, antipsychotics are so unpleasant that the only reason that people stay on them is that they must be working, and so it's a surrogate uh, outcome measure. Um, but you know, another reason why people might stay on the um, on, in the study is because they've been threatened with a commitment order if they drop out. Mm -hmm. You can't simply have that as your primary outcome measure and not look at the other measures of how they're doing. Certainly. Thank you. Additional questions? Um, I'm just wondering, uh, uh, the growing partnerships between pharmaceutical companies and uh, university research institutions, is there uh, any um, measures being taken that you know of to uh, reduce the, that partnership, the strength of that partnership? Um, uh, you know, because you're you're just uh, you're showing here the disintegration of the of the integrity of the research uh, is going way up, and uh, uh, supposedly due to uh, cooperation or interference with pharmaceutical industry. So I was just wondering if there's any any measure being taken to reduce that at all that you know of. So I can remember. Um you know, I've been talking about pharma stuff uh, for 20 years or so now, and I can remember, you know, pretty much at pretty much every institution that I've been at, there's been some person in the hospital, some, you know, anti-pharma clinician somewhere, who comes to me and uh, says, you know, I need your help. What we need to do is get the drug reps out of the hospital. Um, you know, they're, they're buying pizza for the residents. And, you know, and we got to stop it. You know, they're, you know, they're buying lunch for the medical students. They're buying pizza for the residents. Uh, you know, we need to clean this up. And, you know, I'm all for that. That's great. But what about your department chair? I mean, you know, medical students and residents are at the very bottom uh, of the hierarchy in the hospital. And, you know, the idea that you're somehow making a huge difference by cutting out the pizza that the drug companies are buying for the reps and just overlooking the massive amounts of money that your department is getting in research funding from pharma and that, and that your department chair is getting millions of dollars a year in, in consulting fees seems crazy and okay i understand it's a symbolic measure and you know fine go go for the symbolic measures 
Um, but to me, that's the kind of stuff that you see done. You'll see universities there, you know, who will say, no more reps in the hospital at Stanford or Penn, while leaving the larger problem completely untouched. And the larger problem, it seems to me, if anything, universities are ramping that up. You know, translational research. <laughs> That's the sort of code word for partnerships with industry. And every medical school in the country is ramping up translational research. You know, the other thing that has happened, uh, you know, is that if you look particularly over the last five years, the, um, you know, the settlements against the pharmaceutical industry are getting higher and higher. So 1.4 billion for Lilly, it was half a billion for AstraZeneca, 2.3 for Pfizer, 3 billion for GlaxoSmithKline. The thing is, you know, and, and the story is essentially the same in, every, in, in each, of the, each of these cases. They're partnering with academic physicians to uh, manipulate their research in order to sell their drugs. And, you know, that's clear when the cases are settled. But the pharmaceutical company pays all the money. The academic physicians always go untouched. There will be cases where it's, it's clear that academic physicians have signed on to ghost-written articles produced entirely by the pharmaceutical industry. They'll get punished for that, but not the academic physicians. And I think until these legal, uh, you know, these lawsuits start going after the academics, Instead of, instead of solely pharmaceutical industry, it's not, it's not going to happen. Comment? And I just wanted to thank you for presenting this and doing it so articulately. That's it. <laughs> Really interesting case, but I'd like to come back to your definition of translational research because that's really the topic of today. And one of the ways that I like to define it is going from really fundamental research to bedside and may not necessarily involve the pharmaceutical industry at all. I mean, I know people often take it that way, but the work we do is really doing, for instance, very fundamental cell molecular work, animal work, quantitative human work, and then develop something that could be helpful in the clinic. That's another definition of translational research. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll just speak up. On October, uh, August 24th, the Public Health Service has required new conflict of interest forms at the university uh, across the country. We are implementing new procedures. Have you had a chance to look at what um, is likely to happen now first August 24th based on Sorry, no, no, I don't know. I wish I could help you, but I'm, I'm not the guy to, to ask that. You know, I don't think it has anything to do with the policies. Uh, you know, it, it seems to me that the, the difficulty, at least in this case, um, has to do with what was actually done, not the, the policy. I mean, a psychotic patient shouldn't be, uh, who's been repeatedly judged incompetent to make his medical decisions, shouldn't be uh, asked to consent for a, for a study like this. His mother is there. She should be the one making the decision about his consent. And you know, no, no doubt if you go back and, and look, there's some policy somewhere that, uh, you know, that says this. It's fairly standard practice. But if you, if you have um, a situation with the incentives that are set up this way, you're going to get people 
breaking the rules. Now, there's a, you know, there's a backstory here that I, didn't, uh, that I didn't talk about. And the backstory is that um, the University of Minnesota had been placed on probation. There, there, was, a, there was a CRO running this study, quintiles. So th they're the sort of middleman between the sponsor and the, and the institution. And so um, because of its uh, poor recruiting in another quintile study, they had been placed on probation. And basically, uh, quintiles had threatened to take the study away from them if they didn't step up their recruiting efforts. And so what they did was they set up a special unit in the hospital called Station 12, which is for the most severely psychotic patients. And every person who was admitted to Station 12 was evaluated to see if they were eligible for a research study. And once they did that, their recruitment efforts went through the roof. And Olson was actually sort of highlighted in one of the Quintiles webinars as a, um, you know, as one of their top recruiters. And so you can see it looking at the legal case and the emails back and forth between the Quintiles people and the study coordinator. Um, you know, she's, the study coordinator is constantly, constantly asking, you know, I got, a, I got a patient who I think can, uh, you know, might be eligible, but, you know, his parents are objecting and his grandmother just died and, uh, you know, his, his father is really sick and, you know, what should I do? And they were just like, keep the pressure on, don't let up. Uh, and you can, you can get some hint of the kind of pressure that they're under with the threat, you know, if you don't start getting patients, we're going to shut this whole thing down. That, to me, is the larger issue that's pushing all this. And, you know, no matter what, you know, what, what sort of uh, procedures that you write down in your protocol, as long as those financial pressures are there, there's going to be pressure to push hard against them. Both. Uh, you know, I think a lot of what happened here was just really bad clinical care by Stephen Olson. He wasn't really seeing Dan very often. Uh, he's got a mother who's constantly calling saying, I think my son is going to commit suicide. And he just ignores her, doesn't even return her phone calls. Um, so that's a, that's a problem. But there were, there were institutional failures all along the way. And uh, the, the inst part of the institutional failures are what the University of Minnesota has done after the fact, which is, which is essentially back the, uh, you know, the investigators to the full, refuse to look at the case, refuse to, uh, to look at their conflict of interest policies. The other thing that, you know, that I would say, and you have to understand about the background here, is that the University of Minnesota has had a series of conflict of interest incidents. We were, one of our chair of spine surgery was investigated by the Senate Finance Committee. There have been a number of scandals over the years, uh, over the past five years or so. Um, and uh, because of those, the university had set up uh, a task force to look at conflict of interest again. You know, may, you know, maybe we need to look at this. We're getting all this criticism. We're getting AMSA had, uh, had given them a bad grade in their ranking of, uh, you know, their scorecard of uh, institutional conflict of interest policies. So they set up a new task force to look at conflict of interest. But that fell apart when investigative reporters from the Star Tribune found out that um, the uh, chair of that task force, Leo Ferk, our chair of lab medicine had been disciplined two years earlier essentially for embezzling money from uh, a university grant. That had been hushed up. He had uh, not been punished. And then two years later, he was put in charge of setting up the new conflict of interest policy. And so, you know, when, when the conflict of interest policy actually did come out, <coughs> had very little credibility with a lot of the faculty. Hello. I have a little bit more of a comment. I think there's the individual in the institution, but also the larger cultural framework that's going on with um, 
really the pressures in medicine and in universities with funding cuts and with other kinds of financial pressures as well as pressures to produce and publish and be successful. So there's something going on there. I don't know quite how to articulate that. That's beyond just the individual or the institutional conflicts. And I think my other um, comment is about the informed consent process. I mean, in one way, at one point in time, the person who was gathering informed consent may have really thought they were respecting the person who didn't, was saying things about their mother, that she was intrusive or that she doesn't understand me, just like, she, like he convinced the, the police. Where I see the failure is when you tell the story in retrospect at the, at the times when she was getting alarmed and calling. So I think like placing it at one point, because I can see like as somebody who works in disability rights, he has the right to agree to consent to something in theory unless he's you know showing active incapacity. So um, I just think there's a, there's a lot of great issues that your story raises and things for us to really think about throughout the day. Um, did I really have a question? But you can comment on yeah, my. I can comment on, on uh, both of those. Um, I think in both of those cases. All right. So the person who was getting, uh, um, who was assessing competence and getting informed consent, was the study coordinator, whose salary is paid in full by quintiles, which is, you know, that to me, is a conflict of interest. I mean, she has an interest, a financial interest, in getting as many subjects in the trial as possible. And you know, if she's the one who is assessing his consent, his competence to consent, and getting his informed consent, then that's a problem. The other thing, uh, you know, I guess I would, um, you know, I would agree with you about the internal pressures raised by uh, funding and the pressure to uh, uh, that, that's placed on faculty members to, you know, to generate revenue. I mean, part of the part of the difficulty mm -hmm. here, I think, is that in academic health centers, um, faculty members. I mean, unlike other parts of the university, faculty members are expected to generate their own salaries or some proportion of their own salaries, either by seeing patients or by getting grants. And if you're sort of at the top level. You know, and you can you you're just uh, you know constantly getting federal grants to you know to fund your work. That's great. If you're not, you got to get that money from somewhere, and the pharmaceutical industry is a natural place to turn. And so you know you've you've got the financial interests on the outside, but if you're constantly being pushed, like you know, and you know that you're not going to get your salary if you don't generate it by getting revenue from somewhere. Then that's that's a powerful incentive itself. I agree with you that this was a failure of uh, patient care, and many times the incentive to get enrolled in study is that often the patient get better care when they're enrolled in in a study. So I'm very surprised that Dr. Olson did not see this sub. This, this, his patient more often and took better care of the patient. Um, and, and otherwise, I think many, many people will have, many investigators will have a hard time recruiting patients. I think there's a, a greater question of um, overall quality of mental, uh, a care for mentally ill patients, too. Um, he went to half house. That doesn't always happen out of hospital, for example. Um, and I would, I agree, agree with you. There was this, the IRB having failed to actually um, oversee this in the correct way. And as you have mentioned, the study should not even have been done in the first place, right? I mean that this was no study, as you said. Um, so it, the problem is so so big, and he has become the victim of this, and, and, and a very illu illustrating example. But I, I am very surprised at the quality of care that he has received, despite despite being in the study. I just lost my train of thought. I was paying so much attention to what she was saying. <laughs> uh, I think um, 
Hold on a second, it'll come. Oh, yeah, you've presented a very strong case. Um, but Olson and Schultz are not here to defend themselves. So my question is, if they were here, what would be uh, their defense against the things you've said? And uh, do they have any charges they would make against you? Um, you know, I, I wrote about this for, uh, for Mother Jones and asked both of them, you know, fairly direct questions. Uh, but they refused to answer. I can, t I can tell you some of the things that they said in their depositions. Um, one, of the things that, uh, one of the things that Olson um, disagreed with was the deterioration of Dan in the halfway house. He said, I mean, you know, honestly, you've got a guy who decapitates himself. It's a kind of a hard thing to make a case that he didn't get worse. Uh, but that was the argument he, you know, he made. I, you know, I looked at the records and I looked at Dan's diaries. And uh, to me, it was, it's very hard to avoid concluding that he was getting worse. I mean, the, you essentially have his mother saying one thing and... Uh, his psychiatrist saying another thing, and then he winds up killing himself, and then you have to go back and say, all right, who had a better handle on what was going on? And uh, his argument was simply, you know, there was, there, was no way to, there was no way for any of us to pick this up, and, uh, you know, it's a tragedy. Um, you know, what would they, you know, one of the things that has, uh, you know, that has just, um, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of strange. There, there's so much about this whole thing that makes me angry, but for some reason, you know, once the thing is over, for the university to go back and file a legal action against the mother, somehow that just, that just gets me more than anything else. <laughs> because it seems, you know, uh, w w with some things, you can say, all right, you know, people make mistakes doesn't really look much like a mistake, but, you know, you want to get people the benefit of the doubt. And look, the IRB missed a whole lot of stuff, but, you know, I've been on IRBs. I could easily have missed a lot of this stuff as well. Um, but you can't really make that excuse when the legal department of the university turns around and, uh, and files a legal action against the mother of a guy who is just killed himself in a university study. And I can't, and you know, when I, when I wrote about this, uh, the university's response was, you know, this is standard practice. You know, this is done all the time. This is just a routine legal procedure. And, uh, and you know, this is just the way things are done by lawyers. I haven't really found lawyers who agree with that, but you know, that's, that's their case. So coming back to this idea of that there are failures both individual and institutional, has there, I was just curious to know if you, have you ever heard of a case where a drug or a pharmaceutical company has tried to defer some of the responsibility for a tragedy like this, citing like an individual failure? Or is it in their best interest to kind of protect that relationship that they have with individuals that are participating in these studies? So the question is, do, do the pharma companies throw their investigators under the bus and try right. to blame them? Right, basically. Do, yeah. uh, you know, I don't know. Um, I actually don't know. <laughs> Uh, you know, I know in these pharmaceutical fraud cases, uh, the, the investigators are generally not charged, so there's really no question. I mean, there have been a few, you know, there have been a sort of very, a few high-profile cases 
of psychiatrists who've cited ghosted articles. There's a big case you know, involving GlaxoSmithKline and the former chair of psychiatry at Brown, Martin Keller, who, signed, who authored a ghosted article. Um, that's turned out, you know, admittedly now in court to have been uh, ghosted and fraudulent. But, you know, Brown, GlaxoSmithKline, and the journal it published it have all totally backed him. And my sense is that, you know, if the pharma companies, if, that, if it was a strategy to throw the academics under the bus, uh, some of them would be getting punished too, and they're not. So my guess would be no, but you know I'm not. It's not something that I've ever really looked at too carefully. Thanks. Thank you so much. Sure.